Hi, Lindenwood class. We're back to read the Golden Bull. We're going to pick up with chapter 13. Chapter 13, a bargain struck. Nari, Sita called to his wife, give us an early supper. These children need rest. He and Jomar left the workshop. Zeva served a simple meal of cucumbers, onions, and tomatoes before sitting down with the others. Jomar was so tired he thought he might fall asleep at the table. You've invited the girl to stay the night, Nari said to her husband. Where is she supposed to sleep? The workroom, Sita answered. It's always empty at night. We have no extra cot, Nari said. She'll have to sleep on the floor. Sita turned to Jomar. After Zephyr cleans up, Nari will get her settled in the workroom. I'll show you where you'll sleep. A wide reed bench separated the sleeping quarters from the kitchen area. Behind the bench were three wooden cots with mattresses of braided reed lacing. When Sita bent down to tenderly touch the folded cotton blankets on one of the cots, Jomar knew this had been his son's bed. I'm going out to a little shop near here where craftsmen gather, Sita said quietly. I need to be with my old friends for a while. Friends, Jomar said wistfully to himself. His farm was located far from the nearest village, and the long workday left him no time to be with people other than his family. He wanted friends, but how would he be able to make them here in the city? The long day was finally turning into night. Spreading one blanket over the cot's reed lacing, Jomar sat down on the bed and took off his tunic. He covered himself with the other blanket and left his tunic on top of it. Humming Zephyr's lullaby under his breath, Jomar was asleep in moments. He awoke in darkness. From the workshop came the low thrum of a lyre, a lyre with deep and haunting tones. For a brief moment, the individual notes wove themselves into a small tapestry of patterns, then stopped. Faint echoes of music hung in the air before disappearing entirely. I'm dreaming, Jomar said to himself. Then he heard the stirrings of Nari and Sida and their drowsy, half-formed conversation. What is it? That music. In the workshop, the liar. Who? Nari got out of bed. I'm going to thrash that girl. Jomar sprang up from his cot. Don't hurt her. Wrapping a blanket around his waist, he stumbled toward the workshop. Nari was ahead of him. She searched that room like a common thief took the covering off the lyre and played on it. Sita lit an oil lamp and held it high as he entered the workshop. Its glow caught Zephyr cowering on the floor next to a tall lyre whose cloth cover lay puddled at her feet. Jomar thrust himself protectively in front of Zephyr, but Nari moved toward her as if he were invisible. Nari, leave her be, Sita shouted. You're right, she shouldn't have touched the lyre. But didn't you hear the music she made? As if struck, Nari stopped moving. Sita turned toward Jomar. Who taught her to play like that? I, I made a small lyre for her when she was little, Jomar stammered. She taught herself how to play it. Sita spoke in a faraway voice. I've never heard the music this lyre can make. Beautiful sounds, rich tones. The gods have sent me a sign. Nari's head jerked up. A sign? What sign? Sida gave no indication that he'd heard either Nari's question or Zephyr's soft weeping. He sat down heavily at the table. Last year, Kurgle, the temple music director, had me come to the temple to see an extraordinary lyre that had been created by temple craftsmen. My assignment was to embellish the instrument. Embellish? Jomar asked in a small voice. Yes, embellish, to decorate it in such a way that the lyre would be more splendid than any known, Sita said. It was a great honor to be chosen, Nari interrupted. Again, Sita ignored her. I looked forward to working on it with my son, Aban, already a skilled craftsman. We went to the temple frequently to examine the lyre. We discussed our ideas for its embellishment endlessly. He broke off and rubbed his eyes with the back of his hands. Aban died before we were to begin. Jomar thought this might be the right time to ask his question. How, how did Aban die? 
Sita did not speak for a moment. I sent my son to inspect a shipment of carnelian gems on a trading boat anchored out in the harbor, he finally said. The gems were bound for the temple, so they had to be of the finest quality. He looked up, pride in his eyes. My boy was a good judge of gems. He paused again. Metal tools created for export were foolishly hauled onto the boat before they'd taken off large stones that were coming into the city for the temple sanctuary. Statuary. The boat wasn't built to withstand such a heavy load. It sank. And your son drowned, Jomar said quietly. Nari's body seemed to cave in upon itself on hearing Jomar's whispered words. With an effort, Sita went on. I did not have the heart to work on the lyre without Avan. I went to Kurgal and urged him to give the assignment to another goldsmith. He refused to do so and had the lyre strung so it could be played at the coming New Year celebration without my embellishment. Then Kurgal, always so sympathetic, had a sudden change of heart. He threatened me with the loss of my temple position if I refused to complete the lyre in time for the ceremony. When I reluctantly agreed, he immediately had the lyre brought to my workshop. Sita sat in his chair without moving, then spoke in a thick voice. I agreed because I thought I would not be able to withstand the loss of both my son and my occupation. He rose and entered the workshop to speak gently to Zepha, still huddled on the floor. The gods have brought you here to let me hear the glorious tones of the lyre. You will inspire me as I work on it. Nari broke in. No, only temple musicians are allowed to play that instrument. Sida dismissed what she said with a cutting gesture. I will hear Zappa play on it only for a short while. After we start the gold work, it can't be played. Nari shook her head in disbelief. Your new apprentice is a farm boy who knows nothing. Nothing. Now you would open this house to another ignorant young stranger from the country? Someone who dares to touch the temple lyre? Her voice was raspy. If the girl stays, she'll work for me. Sita's lips tightened, and when I ask her, she'll play for me. A bargain had been struck, but Jomar's only thought was that Zephyr would be safe for as long as she lived here. Thank you, he said to Sita. He grasped Zephyr's hand, prompting her. Zephyr stood. Thank you, she echoed. You'll do my bidding, so don't think you'll lead an easy life of music-making, Nari said. On the day the lyre is finished, you'll go. Jomar caught a flash of resentment in Zephyr's eyes and squeezed her hand in warning. This house was now his sister's refuge, a walled sanctuary within a city full of dangers. Enough talk. We'll sleep, Sita said. Tomorrow will be a long work day. Chapter 14 Necklace for a High Priestess Jomar awoke to find his only garment, still damp, spread out on his blanket. Zephyr had kept her word despite the turbulent night. At home, his dirty tunic would have been washed by his mother, not his sister. He got up and dressed quickly. In the cooking area, Zephyr was preparing wheat porridge for the morning meal. Nari hovered near her, clucking and giving orders. We don't serve plain mush in this house. Add nuts and honey for flavor. When Zeppa put a steaming bowl in front of him, Jomar saw that her hands were shaking. He looked up at her, pointed to his tunic, and nodded his thanks. She smiled weakly. Sita beckoned to Jomar from the workroom. Quickly swallowing down his porridge, Jomar left the kitchen. He looked at the shrouded lyre with new eyes, but it seemed they were not going to work on it today. Instead, Sita took down a wooden tray from a high shelf and put it on one of the work tables. A dozen small, delicately veined leaves of gold lay in a circle on the tray. Lapis beads alternated with those of translucent red carnelian inside the ring of gold leaves. Sida bent to gently blow away dust that had settled over the beads. The high priestess Bitati ordered this necklace some time ago. Avon worked on it and wanted to do the stringing himself. I put it away when he died, but now you will do it. I don't see as well as I used to, but your eyes are young and keen, as his were. I'll get you started. Sitting at the work table with Jomar, Sita held up a length of thin rolled sheep gut, then ran one end of it along a small cake of beeswax. 
This makes the threading easier. Squinting and holding a carnelian bead close to his face, he worked the thread through the hole in the bead, then repeated the process with two lapis beads. Next comes a gold leaf. Lapis and gold go well together. The leaves are delicate. Handle them carefully. Repeat the pattern until the necklace is complete and secure. Jomar pointed toward the three bowls that held the unworked gems. How do rough stones like that turn into these perfect beads? Some day I'll show you how it's done, but now you'll string the necklace. Sita placed Jomar in front of the tray, then went over to the lyre and removed its cloth covering. Jomar gasped. In the darkness of the night, he had seen almost nothing of the lyre. He thought it would be an unadorned wood and gut stringed, stringed instrument. Instead, it was as tall as Zephyr. On a panel in front of the lyre, there were four lively scenes made with inlaid shell depicting human and animal figures. But it's already decorated, Jomar said. What more is needed? You'll see, you'll see, Sita said impatiently. He slid the lyre to a sunny spot and began to examine the instrument with such concentration that Jomar felt that he was alone in the workroom. With an act of will, Jomar made himself turn his attention to the task of stringing the necklace. He worked slowly, trying to imitate Sita's smooth shore movements. Halfway through his assignment, he studied his calloused hands, still covered with cuts from his work at the reservoir. He couldn't believe a farmer's son was shaping the delicate piece in front of him. Jomar worked on, finally needing only one more lapis speed to complete the necklace. It wasn't on the tray. Furtively, he bent down to search the floor, but it had been swept clean. His mind leapt. Zephyr had spent the night in the workroom, alone. Could she have taken the bead? With a jolt, Jomar remembered the merchant in the bazaar holding up a strand of blue beads. How mother would love that necklace, Zephyr had said. Was she secretly planning to return to the farm with a lavish gift for their mother? Jomar could hear the beating of his heart. What if there aren't enough gold leaves? or beads to maintain the pattern, he asked Sita quietly. Sita looked up, frowning. Part of a goldsmith's job is to work that out before beginning something new. Why do you ask? Jomar tried to keep the panic out of his voice. One loppy speed is missing. His words dried up, but he was aware of the sweat on his body. Sita came to the work table and stared at the tray, his lips compressed into a straight line. You will learn how to make a bead sooner than I thought, he snapped. With abrupt motions, Sita selected a piece of lapis from the clay bowl and steadied it between wood pinchers that were attached to the table. Then he poured abrasive sand on top of the gemstone. Picking up what looked like a miniature bow and arrow, he wound the bowstring around it. By pushing and pulling the bow, Sita made the drill spin so fast that its rotations were a blur, like Jomar's mind. He had trouble following what Sita was doing. After a short while, Sita held up the lapis speed for Jomar to see that a narrow hole had been neatly bored through the gem. After you've polished this with sand and wool, you can complete the necklace, he said coldly. Jomar found it difficult to meet his gaze. Now that we know that a bead is missing, will you count the unworked gems in the clay bowls? Sita's eyes had a piercing gaze of a hawk. I don't need to. They've been counted by the temple and by me. The end for now.